do you see in all the inclusion and exclusion criteria uh, for neuropsychological rehabilitation in ABI patients? Do you think that all of them are well defined? They are clear? Well, I'm not sure I understand, but I think for any any patient with brain injury, there's yeah. always something we can do. Yeah. However impaired they are, mm -hmm. and however long post-injury they are, we can do something to make their lives better. So I would say in this, for instance, in a patient, the IBI patient, that would exclude him from this rehabilitation? Well, I don't exclude anybody. It's just, if I'm working with somebody that's minimally conscious, mm -hmm. okay. I would still okay. try to set appropriate goals, mm -hmm. but they would be very small. Mm -hmm. For example, getting the patient to look at you, mm -hmm. or if possible, get a yes-no response. Mm -hmm. If I'm working with somebody who's much less impaired and fully conscious, the goals will be to do with return to work and driving mm -hmm. and remembering to take their medication independently and things like that. Mm -hmm. And all the way along there's a continuum. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't expect the issue of a specific number of hours for treatment or days or uh, do you think that there is a moment in which you no, okay, it's time we have achieved this and it's time to stop the rehabilitation. Now we know we we can we're done with it. Well, uh, there's lots of ways I could answer that. Um, I it, what there's part of me that thinks rehabilitation lasts forever, yeah, there's not a final end point. Um, but also, in the rehabilitation, the style I do it is, uh, we, it's always, we set goals. And the patient and the family and the staff negotiate the goals. Mm -hmm. So you can say, yes, this goal has been achieved, and so that might end it. If, if it's that they want to remember to use a, a notebook to, so they can know what they have to do each day, mm -hmm. then you can say, yes, we've achieved that goal. Mm -hmm. He's doing it now. Yeah. But in terms of always needing help and how to manage their cognitive and emotional problems, that probably never ends. Mm -hmm. But of course, we don't work with patients mm -hmm. forever. You're wondering if rehabilitation can last like for, for Forever, for yes, the rest yes. of the life. Of course. Yes, I mean, uh, there are different resources. Yes. yes. Um, of treatments, of course. So, but so in, in, that, for example, in the rehabilitation centre, the Oliver Zengel Centre, yeah. we see people typically for four months. Mm -hmm. So they come at the beginning. They come four days a week, and then they come two days a week. Mm -hmm. um, and in the beginning, we're, it's an intensive phase, and we're trying to address a number of things. And then the two days a week, it's an integration phase, where we're trying to make sure they can go back to their own environment. That's one type, one style. Yeah. But I have also would work with people at home as an outpatient. Um, and then I might see them for many months sometimes years where mm -hmm. I might go um, for say two hours every two weeks that would be a fairly typical thing. Mm -hmm. um, with other people, with the people who are very impaired, um, it would depend, it could be anything, it could be either I want to achieve one specific thing so I see them just for two or three weeks, mm -hmm. or it might be that it's very ongoing, so I could see them for months. But I'm in a fortunate position because I can choose how to administer this. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, you don't have a choice. You have to do what your workplace demands mm -hmm. of you. So there is this lot of time, there's a phase from the patient, the inpatient who is in the center of rehabilitating. They're not inpatients at the center. Well, no, they patients. Okay, so patients. the patient in the center, rehabilitating, and then going home, the in-between phase. So do you think 
that there should be like all the centers in order to help these patients to keep up with their with their abilities. Yeah. With you know have a obviously a better quality of life and to get the most out of their capabilities. Yeah. So do I think they they don't go and help? Yeah. Yeah, like they should create something at different kind yeah. of center for that. Well, some people need that. Not everybody needs it. Uh, well, I should make clear that when they come to this particular center, the Oliver Samuel Center, they are usually at least two years post injury. Uh, they don't come immediately there. This is for the it's for those patients who could get back to work or could be more independent if they had this intensive, uh, comprehensive treatment package. But for other people, you need a whole range of styles, depending on their level of their, um, so the severity of their brain damage, and depending on the length of time since. So for both of those things, I think we have to have a whole range of styles. But the Oliver's Animal Centre is particularly for those people who at least have a chance of returning to work if they had this big, intensive block. When you talk about severity, um, uh, for instance, you, how do you get that measured? Yeah. Um, can you say, oh, this is too severe, or it is not that bad, whatever. So how do you measure that? Um, of course, counting on the alterations, or all the cost effects, all the after effects, or whatever, the people who are incurred and their after effects, but how do you measure that? How is, well, how severe, you mean it's if, severe? Uh, if I say somebody has a severe memory impairment, mm -hmm. I would use a memory test to determine that. If I, uh, if I say they have severe, uh, if, if I'm going to say they, they, they survived a severe traumatic brain injury, I would uh, be looking back to see what their Glasgow Coma Scale score was. So it's not just, you have to say, um, severely impaired for what? Because the, most of the patients I see at the Representative Centre are not going to have physical problems but they might have severe problems with memory and executive function. Um, but this, this other hospital where I work, they're severely impaired in general, so they're physically impaired, they're cognitively impaired, and I would use cognitive tests to determine that. Um, uh, if I'm dealing with somebody with emotional problems, I would look at some of the emotional tests and say, well, they, they're severely impaired. But this, if I was doing a memory assessment, I would use both a standardised memory test and I would use um, interviews with the family and I would use rating scales. But to me, uh, if I'm saying somebody has a severe memory impairment, usually I use an operational definition. And to me, severe memory impairment means they score zero on a test of delayed memory. But if I want to say I'm going to treat the memory problem, then I would find out how does this problem manifest itself in everyday life? And that would be through interviews, through observations. Okay. So that would be different. But I, if, if, suppose I was doing a research study um, on looking at a new memory aid, which I've done many times. I might say, in order to be entered into this study, they have to score zero on a test of delayed memory. And that's our inclusion criteria. And that's to answer this question about does this memory aid work. But that would be just for the research. If I'm doing a clinical memory rehab treatment, it would be working with that patient's needs in his or her life. You talk a lot about um, the um, optimum, optimum level of well-being. Yes. When patients are Kind of not done, but they are prepared to go to their environment. They must occupy the environment after mm -hmm. uh, rehabilitation. Um, what do you mean by achieving this optimal level of well-being, and what are those the implications? Mm -hmm. 
Well, that was a definition, not my definition, it was a colleague of mine, but I liked his definition. Um, but by their best well-being, they have to feel um, comfortable with their new identity and their new person they are after the brain injury, mm -hmm. not have severe emotional problems, uh, to be able to live as independently as possible. Um, and that's what this holistic rehab tries to do. It addresses the cognitive, emotional and psychosocial problems. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and I think one of the reasons that well-being has been stressed is because um, people sometimes think rehabilitation is recovery and they're very different things. And sometimes they think rehabilitation is treatment, the same as treatment, and it isn't. Mm -hmm. Treatment is something you do to people or give to people, mm -hmm. it's like drugs or surgery. But rehabilitation is much broader. It's helping people to understand what's happened, to um, accept what's happened, to compensate for their difficulties. It's this much broader concept than treatment or recovery. And this well-being, I think, is part of that. So we don't think they're going to recover, but a lot of the work done at the Oliver Zangle Centre is on helping people to understand what's happened to them, the reason you're getting angry all the time, or the reason you're disorganised is because you've had this brain injury, so understanding, then it's um, accepting their changes, so you can't do the job you used to do before, but you can still lead a meaningful life, and we'll find ways to help you do that. Um, so understanding, acceptance, um, compensating for their cognitive difficulties, um, um, uh, helping the families understand. So that's, to me, that's what rehab is. It's all of those things. Whereas I sometimes go to meetings where there's a, an academic neuropsychologist who says, I'm going to tell you about a, a rehabilitation study. And it's not a rehabilitation study, it's not. It's a little treatment study. Yeah. And I don't like that. To me, that's not what rehab is. It's much bigger, broader. Sorry, I'm going Actually.